official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official all right, so I screwed up the recording for Wednesday's class. Uh, the audio didn't get captured, um, at least for the core part of the lecture. So it's, I had to call my parole officer to let me come here on a Saturday in the lab uh, to record it. So this will be re-recording of what was discussed on Wednesday. So before we get into the material, uh, again, everyone should be <laughs> painfully aware of all of these things. Uh, homework, uh, sorry, project two is due tomorrow on Sunday. Um, and then today, Saturday, we're having the special office hours. But again, we've already announced this on Piazza. And then Homework 4 came out this week, and that'll be due the following week on November 3rd. And then we'll be releasing Project 3 uh, probably this Sunday as well. All right, so last class, we were talking about how we're actually going to execute queries. It was basically a discussion of how data moved between the operators in our query plan. Remember we talked about, uh, do you send a single tuple? Do you send a, uh, all the tuples that an operator is going to emit? Or do you send a batch of them? And then we also discuss the, the way sort of the, the control flow of the, of the query plan works. Do you start at the top and go down and pull data up? Or do you start at the bottom and, and push data up? So today we're talking about a little bit further about how do you actually now run these, these queries uh, in our system, now actually in, in parallel, right, using, using m multiple workers. And so the, all the discussions we've had pretty much so far this entire class, except when we talk about concurrent control and indexes, is really assumed that the data system has a single worker, a single thread or process that's running queries. It's not getting interfered. Uh, it's not interfering with other queries running at the same time. So now we've got to worry about, okay, how do we actually, uh, how do we build a system to allow it to run multiple queries at the same time? And then furthermore, how do we allow it to take a single query and run that in parallel across multiple workers? So at today's lecture, I, I'm going to try to use the word uh, worker uh, and not thread or process, because um, you see worker is a sort of higher level uh, computational component of the system, which could be a process, could be a thread, could be a combination of them. But I'll, I'll try to use worker, but when I say thread or process, to think, think worker, unless I'm explicit about it. All right, so the reason why you want to run queries in parallel is, is kind of obvious, right? In a modern, modern systems, modern uh, hardware, uh, you have a lot of parallel resources. Um, and obvious things could be you have a lot of cores on a single CPU, like pretty much everyone's laptop has at least four cores at, at this point. Um, and you can have multiple, multiple CPU sockets, so you have multiple entire processors running together on the same box. Uh, but you also could have multiple uh, storage devices, non volatile storage devices. And we'll see how to run those and handle those in, in a parallel system as well. So why you want to do this is pretty obvious. So in some cases, the, the database system, or the, sorry, the database itself, can't fit on, on a single node, and therefore you have to scale out horizontally or scale out vertically by adding more, more resources. Uh, in some cases, we'll also get higher performance, meaning our queries are going to run faster. We'll be able to run more queries at the same time. And then we won't talk about this so much today, but when we talk about distributed systems, we'll see how we can get better fault tolerance and redundancy by duplicating or replicating the database across multiple machines. So now if any, any one node goes down, we can rely on another one to, to pick up the work behind us. The key thing to understand about this discussion is that even though underneath the covers, we may be making copies of the data or taking a query and, and running it in parallel across multiple, uh, multiple computational units, not across workers. When an application invokes a SQL query, that same SQL query should produce the same result whether or not it's running on a single, you know, single laptop with one CPU core or some giant uh, distributed system with you know, thousands of cores. Again, this is the separation between the logical and physical storage of a representation of, of data. Right? You just declare in your SQL query, this is the query, this is the result I want. And then the data system is, then decides how it wants to distribute it and, and execute it across you know, one or more resources. So again, if it runs on a single node, in theory, it should run also across multiple nodes, across multiple workers. Not always the case, but uh, for today's class, we don't have to worry about that. So in this class also, too, this, this lecture today, uh, we're going to be explicitly talking about what I, would, uh, what I would call parallel databases. And there is a distinction, at least in my mind, between a, what a parallel database is and a distributed database. I mean, conceptually, they're the same thing. You're using more resources to execute your queries. But the, the key thing that I want to differentiate is, in a, in a parallel data system, the, there's the resources, whether it's storage or compute, are going to be physically close to each other, like 
you can think of like on a, on a single box, a single, single, a single laptop, you have one CPU and you have multiple cores and therefore the cores are running basically right next to each other on the same silicon. But they could also be potentially in the same, same rack. Um, right? But, but the, when, you, when one thread wants to communicate, a worker wants to communicate with another worker, uh, we're going to assume that that connection or that, and that communication is going to be fast and reliable and potentially cheap, uh, meaning it's sort of, you're not paying a high cost in terms of you know, money or you know, wait time, latencies to make that, do that communication. So again, think of like two threads running on the same CPU. I can use, you know, if they're running in the same process, then they can easily just write into memory and the other, the other thread can read it, right? And that, that's really fast. If, you, if that communication starts going uh, awry, meaning like you send a message and the other thread doesn't get it, then you're having like severe hardware problems and the whole machine's going to crash anyway, right? Now, there's ordering issues we've got to worry about, and we'll, we'll see how we handle that uh, after, or starting next week. But uh, for now, we just assume like we, we write a message and the other guy's going to get it right away. In a distributed database, the, the assumption is that the, the, the nodes, the resources are going to be far from each other, right? Either not in the same rack, but at least in the same data center, in the same state, the region of the country, or in some cases, worst case scenario, on the other side of, of the planet. Actually, worst case scenario would, would be out in space where the latencies are, are massive. And so in this, in this environment, we, we can assume that the communication cost is going to be fast, and we can assume that it's going to be reliable. So that means in our algorithms, we're going to have to uh, accommodate uh, message loss or node failure and, and so forth in, in our protocols because we might send a message to a, to a resource to get some data or do some computation, and the other side never gets it. So we have to account for that in our, our implementation. So again, we're not going to worry about that so much in, in this lecture here, but we'll see how we have to handle this um, a little bit when we talk about concurrent control, but definitely when we talk about distributed databases uh, later in the semester, at the end of the semester. So for today's lecture, I'm going to talk, first talk about process models. Uh, it's the way the, we're going to organize the workers in our system. Then we'll talk about how the different variations of, of parallel execution we have for queries. Then we'll talk about how to do uh, variations of IO parallelism. And then, as I said, we have a ClickHouse talk that I'll just cut over to from, from class because uh, it was actually really, really good. And it covers a lot, basically covers all the things we're talking about in this lecture. Uh, he, uh, the Robert from ClickHouse basically says the exact same thing and talks about how ClickHouse do, does the things later on. So we'll, we'll, we'll cut over to that at the end of this. All right, so the data system process model is, is the way it's going to be organized, the, 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 the computation resources of the system to execute queries or requests in, in, in parallel, or tasks in parallel. And as I said, the, 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 the component we're going to use to schedule things, or to actually execute things, uh, and we schedule things for them, is going to be what we'll call a worker. And this is going to be some... Uh, you know, some computational piece of the system that can execute tasks have the client and also uh, internal background jobs or internal maintenance jobs. So we'll see later on when we talk about garbage collection and multi-version current control, there's a background process you may have to run, something like Postgres that has to periodically, periodically go through and, and uh, do garbage collection. Or when we talked about large structure merge trees, uh, we had to do compaction in the background, you, know, you would assign that task to a worker. But that the worker could have been used for executing queries as well. So there's, be th there's basically two approaches to how to organize workers uh, in, a, in, in a database system. And we'll go through the, the process per database worker and the thread per worker. And then there's a third category that doesn't actually line up ex exactly with this dichotomy between processes and threads called embedded systems. Um, but I, I think it's worth dis discussing because it's, uh, it is an important aspect of database systems, how to, how to build these things. And then we'll talk about wh what that looks like for the, you know, for, in, in, in the organization of the system. So I would say the, the most common approach of being used today, if you're building your system, is going to be the second one, the thread per data uh, worker. Um, and this is because in the modern era, writing threads uh, is not a, uh, it's not as onerous as it used to be back in like the 80s and 90s, right? So we'll talk about process per worker and see why people had to not use threads back in the, day, in the old days and then why they switched to threads later on. So the oldest uh, process model is, is a process per worker, if you want to support parallel execution. And this is where every worker is its own entire OS process. Like you're calling fork to get a separate process that has its own address space uh, and is scheduled separately from all the other worker processes in, in the system. So the basic setup would be something like this, where you would have your application. It would send a connection request to a dispatcher process running on you know, wherever the data system is actually running. 
Um, and this thing, this batch would actually be part of the data system. So in Postgres, this is called the, the Postmaster. And then the dispatcher says, okay, well, you want, uh, I can't actually, the dispatcher can't actually execute queries. So it's going to pick one of its worker processes to assign to this connection or, or fork a new process if one doesn't exist. And then it tells the application, hey, here's the port number of the, of the, the worker you want to talk to. And then the application then makes a second re uh, connection request to connect to the worker. And then that's where it sends SQL commands for that worker that then execute the query and then return back results as, as needed. Um, so you could have the dispatcher just be like a, like a coordinator uh, where queries show up to the dispatcher and the dispatcher just hands them off to other, other worker processes. Or you could do it like this where you have a sort of, uh, the, the dispatcher is really assigning uh, workers to, 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 the, to the application. So one nice advantage of this approach, although you know, it does have additional overhead to actually use this, because now if you want to communicate with one worker once communicate with other workers, you have to use some kind of IPC mechanism or in the case of Postgres, they use shared memory as, as a way to communicate things, right? So there's a bit more work you have to do. And of course, now you're also relying on the OS to provide all, a bunch of this stuff for you, right? It's, it's in charge of scheduling and so forth. You can play around with uh, priorities and the scheduler, but you really can't do more complex things than you may want to do if you have complete control of, the, of all the workers. So the reason why old systems like Postgres, like Postgres is old. Postgres was first started, the first implementation version of Postgres was 1984. Um, but Oracle does this, DB2 does this. The reason why these older systems use a process per, per worker is because back in the 80s and early 90s, uh, the threading packages for the different versions of Unix out there were inconsistent. Right now we have pthreads, we have POSIX and all that. But back in the day, uh, you know, the threading package for HPOX would be different than the threading package for AIX. And so it would be really, you had to basically have all the, re-implement all the, the threading infrastructure if you wanted to data systems support a bunch of different uh, architectures and systems and operating systems. Uh, whereas like if you had POSIX, fork and join were, were the basic building blocks for a lot of things and all operating systems had those. So you could just do, do fork processes and everything would just work across different systems without making major changes. The, the modern implementation though, the modern approach is use uh, a thread per worker um, and then now, again, you're spawning pthreads or whatever operating system you're running on, and you're having your, your system coordinate uh, and schedule across those things. So in this case, the data system will actually be able to manage its own scheduling now uh, because it has complete control of what thread's going to run and when. Um, the, everything's all in the same address space, so communication costs are pretty cheap between the different workers. Um, now, unlike in the process per worker model, if a thread crashes, uh, uh, in the process per model, if a process crashes, it, it's isolated to this, uh, just that process. If a thread crashes in this world, in, the, uh, in this, this model, then that takes down the whole system. So just like before, the application will connect to the dispatcher, uh, and then the dispatcher can decide, say, okay, this is the thread you're going to run on. And again, we could either have the dispatcher be responsible for forwarding query requests to the, the worker thread to execute, or we just give it back, say, here's the port number you want to connect to, uh, and send your request to this. Right? So pretty much... Every data system implemented in the last 20 years uh, implements, supports this. Even systems like DB2 and Oracle have gone back and added support for the thread, thread, uh, thread, per, process, thread, thread per worker model, even though they originally started off with process per worker. Like I think in DB2, you can switch and say you want to use threads or processes, and depending on what environment you're on, uh, you, you choose one versus another. Um, the only systems that really don't do this is that if you do, if they're forked from Postgres, uh, you know, they're based on Postgres, since they just inherit that process per worker model that Postgres has. So, um, again, and then the other category would be the embedded database systems. In, uh, for, in, so embedded database systems don't really have their own, uh, typically don't ha aren't in charge of their own threads, uh, in, because they're, they're embedded inside of a, a, another application. Right? So the idea is that the application makes calls into this uh, embedded database system library, and then whatever thread made that call into it is then used by the, the data system library to then evoke whatever the query they need to do. DuckDB, can, uh, you can tell it, hey, spin up additional threads that it can use to execute queries in parallel. Um, but the, the, in, in sort of the classic embedded system model, especially like SQLite, uh, and RocksDB, so whatever thread that's being entered in to request do an operation, that's the thing that's, that's going to execute it. And there, so there isn't a dispatcher, right? So in the case of the application code, um, 
the application has, about, has its own threads, and then it can make calls into the data system to do whatever it, whatever it needs. So as far as I know, that one of the first embedded data systems uh, that supported this model uh, was Berkeley DB. Um, that came out of, obviously, uh, Cal University of California, Berkeley in their early, early 1990s, um, late 1980s. That was bought by Oracle in, in 2016. When a query shows up, the data system is, 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 has to decide how and where it wants to execute it uh, and when should it execute it. So most data systems are going to do a really simple uh, first in, first out uh, priority uh, queue. So whatever query shows up, that gets the first execution. It gets to execute first. Um, the, but it doesn't have to be that, right? There's other policies and things you can actually implement. But the data systems often decide, okay, for this given query, on this, I know what data is going to access, and therefore I can decide how many tasks should I break up the query into? How many, how many cores or workers should I use to execute things? Uh, when, it, when a worker executes and produces some, some output, where should it go? Should it go in the same, you know, the same worker or should it go to another worker? Right? All these things the data system can, can schedule for you. And this is, again, why we want to do everything ourselves. Even though the operating system has, a, has, a, has a, their own scheduler, it doesn't know what the queries are actually want to do and what's in the pipeline to execute. So, because it just sees blind processes or threads, so again, the data system is always going to be a better position than the operating system to figure out what to do. And then the higher end systems, like the enterprise systems, like Oracle, DB2, and SQL Server, have, again, they rewrite basically everything and don't rely on the operating system to do anything. So the, so the different process models are going to allow us to, again, take advantage of different uh, multiple workers in our system um, and potentially run things in, in, in parallel. But the key thing to understand is that just because a, a system supports multiple workers in, uh, you know, in running in, inside of it, it doesn't mean that they're always going to be able to do what we'll call intro query parallelism, meaning like just because they can have multiple workers run, if a query shows up, it doesn't mean they can divide that query up across those multiple workers. Like MySQL is probably the most famous of this. Like MySQL is a, uses the thread per worker model, uh, so it's, it's a multi-threading uh, database system, but one query shows up, only one thread can execute that query into its entirety, right? Uh, they can't split up across multiple cores. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll see that in a second. And as I said before, pretty much every system that is based on Postgres or Redis is probably the other most famous one that's a single process, single worker system. Uh, unless you're forks of these things, uh, you're going to be support, uh, you know, uh, you're going to support multiple workers. N now that we defined our process models, we want to talk about how we're going to architect the system to support uh, parallel execution of multiple operators instances or multiple operators either running in part of the same query or multiple queries at the, at the same time. Um, and the, the high-level approaches that we're going to talk about here today aren't going to really, don't really matter whether you're using multi-threading or multi-process or multi-node in a distributed system, right? Because it's just about, like, how do I say, here's what you're going to execute, and then where do you put your data? And then that communication cost between the workers, you know, the cost of that will depend on what environment and, and what process model we're actually using. So there's two high-level approaches to do uh, par uh, query parallelism. So the first would be inter-query parallelism, and uh, then we'll talk more detail about intra-query parallelism. So inter-query parallelism is, a, is what I was saying before, where you can have multiple queries uh, from you know, different connections or different application requests running simultaneously in the system. Um, and as I said, most systems are just going to do first-come, first-serve. So whatever query shows up first, uh, it'll get scheduled to execute before any queries that come after it. In some systems like DB2, you can specify transaction or, or queuing priorities based on like the username. So like a, a, the CEO might have their queries run faster than you know, somebody in, in sales. So if all the queries are read-only, meaning they're not actually modifying the database, then this is pretty easy to do because you don't need to coordinate between the different uh, queries running at the same time because you know no one's going to update anything. Now, you still have to use those internal protection mechanisms that we talked about in the buffer manager and the indexes, as I said before, because they may be trying to access the internal data structures at the same time. But the, the logical database isn't going to get changed. So we'll see how we handle that, uh, how to hand updating queries uh, in, in, in two classes for now. Um, but for now, it's, it's, uh, we're now just assuming that's not going to happen. That makes our lives a lot easier. Again, the challenge is, again, if, if, if they do update things, then we have to worry about who is reading what and when. But we'll, again, we'll cover this later uh, in, in lecture 16. So for intro query parallelism, this is typically most people think about when say I run, I'm running par queries in parallel. Right? The idea is that we have a single query that we can break up into uh, multiple tasks that we then assign to multiple workers to run, run at the same time. And we can cut down the, the execution time of query, potentially. 
So you can sort of think of the same way that we talked about operators in our query plan when it was single thread execution of you know, sending data between op one operator to the next. It's sort of this high-level producer-consumer model. We're going to do the same thing now when we run things in parallel, but now we're going to have explicit control or uh, mechanisms to say, I know I have these tasks running in parallel, and I'm, I can wait until they all produce the results I need before I move on to the, the next pipeline, the next stage of my query plan. So there's going to be two uh, approaches to do uh, intra-query parallelism. The first would be horizontal parallelism, uh, sort of scaling out uh, multiple, multiple instances of the same operator. Uh, running at the same time, and then vertical parallelism or interoperator parallelism, that'll be different pipelines or operators running simultaneously. And again, and then there's an explicit dependency graph between them. So these techniques are not, not mutually exclusive. Um, you, you can mix and match with them. Uh, again, the higher end systems can do that. And the way we're actually going to implement all the various algorithms we talked about so far, uh, there'll be basically some minor changes to them, but there's, there's almost parallel versions for all the algorithms that, that we talked about before. Uh, and so, for example, if we go to our, our hash join we did before, the, the Grace hash join, remember how we talked about how the, in the f sort of first phase, we went through the, the build side and the probe side, the RNS tables, and we generated buckets uh, uh, for each of them so that when we, when we, so we divide things up so that now we can just bring in uh, things sequentially into memory and do our joins for just the, the, the buckets we know that things would match. You can now sort of think of like the buckets now can, can after I partition them up, the bucket can then now be processed independently by different, different workers at the same time. So like the worker one can do the, the first level of the hash table, and it doesn't need to coordinate with the other workers processing other, other buckets or other levels because we've already divided things up before. So we basically, we're, all the divide and conquer stuff we talked about before, we can apply in, in the same world as well. And just, but now we just run things in, in parallel. So... As I sort of said, there's, there's the horizontal parallelism, there's the vertical parallelism, and then I think the textbook mentions that there's this third category of bushy parallelism, which in my mind is basically just the combination of the first one and the second one, but we can talk about it. And the way to think about how common these different approaches are, the first one is, is obviously the most common one, but having multiple operators, uh, instances of the same operator running in parallel. Uh, Interoperator parallelism is slightly less common, but you'll see this more, in, especially in streaming systems, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, later in the semester. Um, and then the Bush parallelism, that's just, the, again, the higher end systems can, can do all these things. All right, so in interoperative parallelism, the idea is that we're going to take our query plan, uh, and the operator, uh, the operator in invocations are going to be then now uh, duplicated or replicated across multiple workers that they run in, in parallel at the same time. But the key thing we're going to do is we're going to assign each operator instance, each task for their operator, to process a different subset of the input data. So if again, think I have a table of 1,000 tuples, and I have four worker threads. I'll give the first 25% uh, of, of the data to the first worker, the next 25% to the next worker, and so forth. And then now they can do the scan, apply any filters, do whatever operations they want in parallel, and they don't need to coordinate with each other, and we're not duplicating work because each one's uh, processing a disjoint subset of, of the database. We're, we're sort of partitioning things and, and handing them out to the different workers. But now we got to, in some cases, we have to put the data back together. So we sort of split things up, allow them to, to operate on physical subsets. But now in some cases, in order to do some, uh, some additional operators in our query plan, we got to put things back together. Because remember we talked about, I can't do a hash join if I don't completely fill up my hash table, because now I start probing it, I may, may get false negatives. So there's going to be this, we're going to introduce this new mechanism called an exchange operator uh, that doesn't map to anything in relation to algebra, but it's, something we need to, again, do this coalescing. We're going to introduce that almost as pipeline breakers again to, as a way to say, I can't proceed up in the query plan until all the uh, operators below me that, I'm, uh, that are my children produce the results that I need. And again, it doesn't matter whether I'm doing a push versus a pool model. It doesn't matter whether I'm doing the iterator, or the, the materialization, or the, the vectorized uh, processing model. Right? The exchange operator, again, is that barrier to make sure that we don't proceed in the query plan until we know we have all the, the, the physical data we need. Postgres is going to call this uh, this uh, gather. Uh, if you're familiar with like the map reduce world, it's, it's sort of the same, same way. It's the barrier between you start the, before you knock the next phase. But the original paper that described this approach uh, came uh, from this guy, Gertz Graffy, the same guy who wrote that B plus G book that I was talking about before, and the same guy who's going to talk, talk about query, uh, did a bunch of stuff we'll talk about in query optimization uh, in the next class. Right? He wrote this paper uh, in the early 90s or late 80s uh, for this project called Volcano, and then he defined out exactly this, uh, you know, th this exchange operator there. 
All right, so today we're doing a query now, joining A and B, and we're AID, let's BID, and then we have additional filter on A.value and B.value. So the first thing we're gonna do is execute the, uh, the scans on A. So let's say now, again, we're gonna divide the table A up into three, three, three partitions or three shards, and we're gonna assign each of those their own worker. But now we actually can sort of start building up the pipeline in our, in each of these, for each of these workers, because again, we know we don't need to coordinate between any of them yet. Because each one can scan A, but now they can also do the filter on A value uh, here, and then just keep going up the query plan and pushing things up. And then say we also want to then uh, bring down the, the projection to throw away a bunch of the data that we don't need. Because again, we know what we need up in the query plan. We need AID and, uh, to do the join. So we could actually filter out anything else that isn't AID after we do our filtering here. And again, we can do this all in parallel. We don't need to coordinate between the different workers to do, to do projections. And then now we're going to build our hash table. And then this is where we introduce our exchange operator. So for simplicity, just assume that there's a single global hash table here in the, uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in sort of the higher, higher end systems, you can have multiple hash tables, uh, but we can ignore that for now. But for assume simplicity, everyone's writing to the same hash table. So they're building the hash table and then we don't, uh, we tell the exchange operator up above, we don't sort of invoke that until we know that all the data we, We've, we're ever going to process is, uh, is done. So that exchange operator, again, is the barrier waiting for, the, for all the, the, the children workers below to say, I got everything, I processed everything I need to process, I'm done, you never, never have to come back to me. So you can sort of think, again, these are the pipelines that are, again, run th these tasks one after another, uh, these operators one after another, and then they're feeding the exchange operator saying, like, I got more, I got, I got more, I got more, and then it keeps going until it says it's done. And then now above the exchange operator, that's where we get to do the join operator because we know we built everything we needed in our hash table uh, on the build side of the join. So when that exchange operator gets the notification from everybody, everybody below, then it says, oh yes, now, now I'm good on my side, we can do the join. And then now say they do the same thing on B, again, divide it up into three shards, or three partitions. They'll also do the, the, the filter and the projection just like before. And then now they can also probe the, the, uh, the hash table in parallel. But we don't need exchange operator above, above, above the probe, right? Because we're doing the join to the hash table to see if we have a match. And then tuples are coming out, out of that operator. And again, we don't need to coordinate anything at this point between the three different workers. But we do need to know whether we've finished processing all of the, the data in these, these pipelines for B. So we'll put an exchange operator above that that says, okay, I know I have three workers below. When they're all done, uh, let me know. And it's producing a single output stream uh, for these, these pipelines down below. So this is the most common version of the exchange operator. Uh, this is the gather approach, again, taking multiple input streams and producing a single output stream. But there's other approaches you could do. Um, and so this is a, this is a sort of a taxonomy that's defined or just, that's used by SQL Server to describe the different variations that they have of, of exchange operator. So again, the, the gather one is taking multiple outputs and putting into a single out, uh, multiple out input streams and producing a single output stream. The distributed operator is taking a single input stream and then resharding and repartitioning to spread across multiple output streams. Um, and then the repartition one is, is basically the combination of the two. So I have multiple input streams uh, and I'm producing multiple output streams, but it doesn't need to be a one-to-one -one match between the inputs and outputs. So I could take, in my example here, I'm taking three input streams from three sort of pipelines below me and I'm producing two output streams. So the distributed operator or the repartition operator, this is used often in distributed systems because you, may want to rebalance things based on what the data looks like as it comes in. So my example here is for Dremel and BigQuery, which are the same systems. It's, Dremel is the internal name of what Google calls their BigQuery system. But the, they have an explicit uh, repartition step between every single pipeline, uh, and this sometimes, again, called shuffle. The idea is that when you first uh, plan the query, you, you think the data is going to look a certain way. So you say, I'm going to run on, say, 100 workers. But then as the data comes in, you realize it's, it's, uh, your filters are more selective, so you have less data, so you can scale down after the, after the repartition and say, I, I, I thought I need 100, but I only need 80. Or you go the opposite. I, I thought I need 100, but I, I need 200. Or I thought my distribution was going to look like this, uh, but it was a uniform distribution of the data, and now looks really skewed, so I'm going to rebalance things differently. So it's a way to sort of like again, reorganize the query plan while it's running uh, in a dynamic fashion or ad adaptive fashion. Most systems don't do this, uh, or don't support that, that adaptivity, but the repartition one is, is, can, can be common in the OLAP systems, the data warehouses. 
All right, so now we're gonna talk about, okay, the, how to, that was intra operator parallelism. So within sort of one operator, I have multiple versions of it running at the same time. Now we're talking about inter operator parallelism where you have distinct operators that are running actually at the same time, even though there may be a de dependency of data between them. But in some cases, like the way the query plan is sort of set up, I want to run them at the same time and have not have one operator wait for all the, the data to come out of its child operator before it starts running. So the, this is sometimes called pipeline parallelism. We're still going to need the exchange operators that we talked about before because you need to know, uh, you may need to coalesce things from multiple shards from, from down below and produce one or more output streams based on the, imp uh, the input streams that are coming in. All right, so a really same example would be something like this. So they have that same join before, but let's now say I do my join in one worker as one sort of operator instance. And then this thing's just scanning through the, the table, uh, the two tables and producing the join and then emitting them out as, as the output stream. But then now let's say I have this projection, uh, this projection operator, instead of inlining or, or fusing the in that we saw before in the pipeline, I'm gonna have it run as a own separate worker as well. Say for whatever reason, this, the projection here is very expensive to compute. Like we're computing a hash of a hash of a hash or something, and therefore it's very CPU intensive, and therefore I don't want to burden the join down below with doing that, that hashing. I want to put that on, on a separate worker, right? So now as the, 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 the first worker is doing the join producing output, it puts it in a queue that then gets sent up to the separate worker, and then thing, th th this thing just waiting for new inputs to come in, and as soon as, as, soon as it gets something, it crunches it and produces the output. Again, this is more common in, in streaming systems like Spark SQL, Kafka, and other things because in that world, you sort of have this, this continuous query operation where there isn't actually an end to the data that you're inputting. Like it's an in input stream of like stock ticks or temperature readings. There's data just always coming in as a stream and therefore it's not like a you know, scan on a fixed size table where you scan it and you're done. This thing's just always running. All right, and then the last one again, as I said, is, is bushy parallelism. Uh, and they, this is just intermixing or a combination of the horizontal inter interoperator, sorry, the, the horizontal parallelism with uh, interoperator and the vertical parallelism with interoperator, just putting all together and using them at the, at the same time. And again, we still gonna need exchange operators because we need to know in some cases that I get all the data I expected from, from my query down below me. So this is a contrived example, but I'm doing a Cartesian product between tables A, B, and C, and D. And so now I can do my, my query plan I'll do my join on, uh, on A and B simultaneously as the join in C and D, and then there's the, the, the cross join up above that I'm running on worker three and four that's just intermixing all of these tuples uh, and producing all possible combinations of them. And I have buffers to keep track of what I've seen before, and as new, new, new tuples come in, I can match them. Right? This is obviously be a very expensive operation, uh, and yes, it, the, the size of the interview results would explode, uh, but you can, again, you can at least computationally run these in parallel and rather than just waiting for everything to get queued up and, and finished. All right, so everything we talked about so far is about computational parallelism, right? How do we get multiple workers to run simultaneously and, and process things in parallel? Of course, though, if now you're bottlenecked on the disk, even though it's gotten a lot faster than, uh, than in the past, in S modern SSDs with N NVMe, you know, that still could be a bandwidth if you're just, you have to read a lot of data in your query. Um, and then also, too, if you're, if you're using a page table um, and managing, managing that with latches, that could become a bottleneck. But the, the getting things off the disk and bringing it to memory, that can be a bottleneck, again, depending on the speed of the, the drive. So in some cases, it actually doesn't matter that if you have a bunch of parallel workers that can run the queries in parallel or run a query in parallel, if they all have to go to disk and you're blocked on that, then uh, you're sort of, you know, the, the parallelism isn't going to help as, as much. Now, we'll see later on how to do tricks of like, if I know one guy's gotta go out the disk and get something and this other guy can, can run because everything they need is in memory, then I can play tricks of scheduling, of scheduling that guy first and then letting that disk I.O. Happen, happen asynchronously in the background. So that way I'm always doing, trying to do, do useful work even though I'm blocked on disk. But again, in general, I think if this is just slow, then the parallelism can only go so far to help you. And so this is why we're gonna need I.O. parallelism. Uh, and so the idea here is that if we can take our, our, our database system's data in, in our database and we can spread it across multiple storage devices, then this could potentially produce our, our disk bandwidth because I could have some part of the system read data from one, one disk and another disk and now ignoring whether you know, my, my PCIe channel is the bottleneck, I can get data, I can have more concurrent requests and have a higher throughput uh, for, for my data. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. 
uh, like the most simple thing is like you have a single database, uh, uh, one, one per database, or sorry, a single disk per database. You could have uh, put multiple disks for, for a single database. So, so logically, it seems like a single database, but physically, it's across multiple storage devices. You could put a single table, a single relation per disk. You could split a, a disk across multiple disks, or so, so split a, a relation or a table across multiple disks. In some systems, you could actually say for the write intensive portion of, of, the, of the system, like the write ahead log, the log keeping track of all the updates I do, you put that on one disk and then put the data from the regular tables, put that on another disk. So you're always writing real fast at this thing and then you're reading your reads to the, the data doesn't interfere uh, with the writes. Right? There's a whole different combination uh, of ways to approach this. In the higher end systems, they will, they will, they will have explicit control of how to handle IO parallelism. Like in Oracle, you can say, again, put the write-ahead log on this drive and then split my tables, uh, my data tables across these other drives. And the, the data system will manage all that for you. Uh, in systems like you know, MySQL, for example, the, the disk can just be managed by taking a, um, uh, just in the actual data directory itself, you just put sim links to different drives. Uh, and the data system doesn't know you've done that, which is you know, now you're getting that parallelism because the, the multiple disks can, can run simultaneously and not interfere with each other. Postgres, I think, has table spaces where you can say these tables belong in this table space and it tells you what, what physical location goes on disk. But again, the, 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 the higher-end systems have complete control of all of these things. All right, so what does this look like? So say now we have a, a, a database and it has six files. All right, sorry, six pages, right? It's really simple. So I'm going to show two extremes of, of the different variations of how to support a, you know, a multi-disk parallelism. Um, in the first case here, say we have three disk drives, and we'll do the first approach we call it striping, or if you're familiar with RAID, it's, it's RAID 0. And basically, every single page uh, in a round-robin fashion, we're going to write them out to one disk drive at a time. Uh, so, so page 1 goes to disk 1, page 2 goes to disk 2, and page 3 goes to disk, page three goes to disk 3, and we to keep wrapping around, looping around this round. So now this is where that... Um, Remember that page directory we talked about at the beginning of the semester? This is where we keep track of this information. So now if I do a look on page one, I'm going to know, oh, it's on disk drive one, and therefore at this location, let me go fetch it. Because right? again, the data system can, can, can manage this itself, or you can rely on the hardware to do this for you, where it just transparently looks like a single logical disk, even though physically it's broken up multiple disk devices. And again, if the data system has control of this, it can be responsible for deciding how to split things up. The other end of the spectrum of striping is called mirroring. And this is RAID 1. And this is where, for every single page we have in our, in our, in our database, we're going to write that out, uh, multiple copies out, to every single uh, unique disk drive we have. So page 1 is going to be written on disk 1, disk 2, disk 3. Page 2 is written on disk 1, disk 2, disk 3, and so forth. Right? And so the advantage of this now is, uh, if I have to do a bunch of reads, that's going to go faster, because now I, I go fetch the... I can go to actually any of the disk drives and I get exactly the copy that I need. Of course, now this makes the writes more expensive because any one write you do to a page has to be written in triplicate across these three drives. Whereas in striping, it was always a one-to-one -one mapping between a page and, and a uh, page and a and a disk drive. So, the there's hardware that actually can do this all for you. Uh, in there's you know, I'm saying is RAID 0, RAID 1. There's different levels of RAID that can inter, inter, mix and match all these things, and there's different trade offs to all of them. So in some cases, you can get hardware to do this for you. So now it appears like a single logical device, uh, but physically it's, it's all split across. And this would be transferred to the database system. The data system wouldn't know that it has multiple disk drives. It just thinks it has a faster disk or uh, higher capacity disk ba based on what, what, what you're doing. The, uh, the software-based approach is when the data system can manage it themselves, and now you can do much of other tricks to not just have to do either striping or mirroring, you can use erasure coding to do some, get some sort of blend of the two of them. Uh, and this is typically going to be faster and more flexible than doing hardware support. Uh, but again, not all systems actually support this. So the way to sort of think about this, uh, the trade-offs for IO parallelism or, or disk parallelism, is a trade-off between performance, uh, durability, and capacity. So in my examples before where, where I was doing... Um, Say I was doing uh, the, the mirroring approach. I'm, ex I'm basically wasting, if you will, multiple disk drives, but I'm storing the data in, in duplicate. So one, now if one disk drive crashes, uh, I can rely on the other two to still read my data. So I'm getting better durability. And my reads are going to go faster because now I can have any one read from any one page be handled by any, any of the, the, the three disk drives. But my capacity is basically cut. Uh, uh, I'm, 
in, you know, by a third because I'm, st or I'm down to one third of what, it, what it, the total size could be because now every, every, every disk has the entire copy of it, right? Whereas striping is I'm getting great capacity, uh, but my durability and better performance, but my durability isn't as good. So there's these trade-offs that you have to consider when you, when you sort of deploy a real data system of how you want to handle this. S3 kind of changes all of this because S3 is now managed by, by Amazon or whatever the object store uh, in your cloud provider you're using, whatever the equivalent is. And they're storing data, I think, in five times. Um, but again, it's all transparent to the data system. You don't know if you do a read request or a write request, you know, where it's actually being physically go going. Um, and S3 is actually not that fast. That's like hundreds of milliseconds potentially per, per, per read and write. Um, but it's, you know, the, the data system doesn't manage any of that. Amazon manages that for you. So again, there's trade-offs of how much you want to do yourself versus how much you rely on external services, either through hardware or through a cloud service. The other thing to also mention, but we'll talk a little bit about, we'll go more detail when we talk about distributed databases, is how we're actually doing this, this splitting things up. So I sort of said before, when, 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 when we're talking about uh, the horizontal parallelism, the intra-query, uh, inter intra-operator intra parallelism, I would have my different operator instances crunch different portions of a, of a, of a of a table or input data, right? That data is going to be partitioned or sharded based on some some attribute. Um, and so, it's if the data system is just stored in separate directories, then that's really easy to do because you say this operator processes this directory, this operator processes this other directory. Um, but when, what we really want to be able to do is to do explicit partitioning within our database system, where the database system is responsible for deciding how to divide things up, where to store it, and then how to bring back things in into memory and process it in, in, in parallel. So again, this is the advantage of, of SQL again, because the same query that would work on a database that's not partitioned, that's not split up, should still work in theory on a, if a database is partitioned or is split up, um, because it's only processing these logical tables. It doesn't work actually the, the physical layout of things. Um, it doesn't always happen uh, in, in some cases, but th that's, that's the goal of, of in you know, doing this, this partitioning scheme. So again, we're not going to talk about it any further right now. Uh, we'll go into more detail of this uh, when we talk about distributed databases uh, around Thanksgiving. All right, so finish up. Parallel execution is super important. Uh, and pretty much every single uh, major data system you can think of is doing some variation of it. Even SQLite, right? SQLite's like this, this I mean, it's a very sophisticated system, but it's, a, you know, it's an embedded database system that isn't, doesn't have all the features of like a full-fledged Oracle or, or DB2 or SQL Server. Uh, but it supports parallel execution. Uh, it does inter-query inter -query parallelism. So you can have multiple readers and a single writer, um, and that, that all works just fine. But all the things we talk about that we, we the, to get right, like the coordinate, coordinating the different workers, scheduling them, uh, if they have to start doing writes, how do you handle that? What if everyone's trying to read from the disk at the same time? How do you handle that? All these different topics and things like that you have to, you have to account for when you start building things out. And it's ideally, you don't want to rely on the operating system to manage disk I.O. and other things for you. And you want to do everything yourself. All right, so next class, we're going to talk about query optimization. Uh, so this is the idea of, again, taking our SQL query and then actually now generating the physical plan that we're going to execute on our workers. Uh, and so this semester, we're only going to do one lecture on this. Uh, and it was, so it sort of be a, a quick overview of the topic. It's very, very hard. It's the thing I know the least about in databases. But then uh, in, the, in the spring class, spring 2025, we'll be teaching of course, entirely on query optimization. So, so if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, we can go to this in more detail. Based at ClickHouse Inc. And I want to give you um, a high level intro to the things that make ClickHouse SQL database. You probably think ClickHouse is a funny name. I guess it is. ClickHouse was originally an abbreviation for Clickstream Data Warehouse. So that should give you an idea of what the system is about. But you know, people like the abbreviation and we simply kept it. Uh, here we go. All right, so what is ClickHouse at a high level? ClickHouse is an open source column-oriented distributed OLAP database. Development started 15 years ago at Yandex. Eight years ago, the code was open sourced. In these eight years, ClickHouse became super popular, now with more than 2,000 contributors on GitHub. The code is written in C++ and it compiles into a single statically linked binary, which runs on pretty much anything from Raspberry Pis to the most powerful servers. Being a column store, People typically use ClickHouse for filter and aggregation queries over billions and trillions of rows. The storage layer under the hood is optimized for append-only workloads, um, and it provides very fast inserts. I'll get to that in a second. You can also build a cluster of ClickHouse nodes, and 
um, replicate and shard your data for higher availability and scalability. If you do that, the database will be by default only eventually consistent in the interest of high performance. Typical use case of ClickHouse include business intelligence, log and, and event analysis, and real-time dashboards. Let's dive a bit deeper into the architecture of the system. There's a lot of stuff on the slide, but the important parts are in red, the query processing layer, and in blue, the storage layer. The query execution in ClickHouse follows the traditional approach of parsing a SQL query, building and optimizing a logical plan, building and optimizing a physical plan, and then finally executing the, the physical execution plan. The storage layer has a concept of pluggable table engines, which each represent the location and the format of the table data. There's a similar abstraction in MySQL, so we didn't come up with that idea by ourselves. In the interest of time, I will only talk about the native storage format of ClickHouse, which goes by the name Merge Tree Table Engine. It's actually a family of table engines. Therefore, on the slide, it's called Merge Tree Star Family Table Engines. This slide shows the Merge Tree Table Engine in more detail. What happens if you insert a bunch of rows into a table is that the new rows are sorted by the primary key columns of the table and then stored as a so-called part on disk. Once written, a part cannot be changed anymore. It is immutable. We encourage our users to insert the data in batches, for instance, 20,000 rows at once to avoid that too many, too little parts are created. To prevent the parts from accumulating, they are also continuously combined into bigger parts by a merge job, which runs in the background. Now, remember the parts are sorted. This means that the merge job can use a K-way merge sort algorithm to combine the parts, and that is um, relatively cheap. ClickHouse also provides an asynchronous insert mode, which basically um, buffers the rows from multiple inserts before they are flushed to disk. So if you really want to do lots of small in smaller inserts with very few rows each, you can use asynchronous inserts. Now, if all of this reminds you of log structured merge trees or LSM trees in short, you're right. The difference to classical LSM trees is that all parts in ClickHouse are created equal. They are equal. They are not organized in a hierarchy. This has advantages. This has disadvantages. On the one hand, the merge can freely pick which parts to combine. It is not bound to certain LSM tree levels. On the other hand, updates and deletes become a lot more tricky, but I'll not talk about these today. For the majority of our use cases, updates and deletes are the exceptions, so that's usually fine. I talked about parts on the previous slide. This slide zooms into a single part. The stuff shown here isn't terribly interesting. I'll just say that after a few rounds of merging, parts typically contain a few dozen million rows. Logically, each part is further divided into so-called granules, each of which contains about 8,000 rows by default. All the disk accesses are made at the granularity of granules, not rows. In the example on the left, you see two granules, G0 in blue and G1 in red. To reduce the data volume, we also compress consecutive granules. Users can specify the compression algorithm to use. There are generic codecs like CSD and logical codecs like Delta. OK, now ClickHouse has a reputation for being fast. One of the tricks we use to speed up queries is aggressive data pruning. The idea is that you want your select queries to skip as much data as possible because every byte you don't read and don't process helps performance. ClickHouse uses three data pruning techniques. The first one are primary key indexes. I mentioned earlier that each part is sorted by the primary key columns of the table. ClickHouse will additionally create an index structure which maps from the primary key column values to granules. The mapping is quite small compared to the total table size and um, kept in memory. For example, with just 1,000 entries, you can index already 8 million rows. Now, if you have a query that filters on a prefix of the primary key, col key columns, ClickHouse will use the primary key index to find the right granules directly instead of scanning the whole thing. The second pruning technique we use are table projections. Think of a table projection as an alternative version of a table. A projection contains the same rows as the original table, but it's sorted by, different, by a different primary key. If you have lots of queries which filter on other columns than the original primary key columns, you want to use a projection. The cool thing is, this works at part granularity. 
That means a part can have no or one or multiple projections, and the query engine will choose for every part the optimal data representation to read from at query time. The third pruning technique in ClickHouse are skipping indexes. The idea here is to annotate the granules with metadata. That metadata enables to the scan to check if no rows or, or some rows or all rows of, in the granule will match the predicate. There are now different types of skipping indexes in ClickHouse. For instance, you could store the minimum and maximum value for every granule or the unique values, or you could create a bloom filter for every granule. Each type, of course, has different trade-offs, but generally speaking, skipping indexes are more lightweight than projections, but they're also a lot more data dependent and harder to tune. Say again. Exactly. ClickHouse also has a really cool feature that we call merge time data transformation. I mentioned earlier that parts are continuously getting merged in the background. The merge job is able to apply additional transformations to the data. For example, there are so-called replacing merges. A replacing merge will check if there are rows with the same primary key values in the input parts. These rows are basically considered as duplicates. If it finds such rows, it only keeps the one from the most recently inserted part. You can think of this conceptually as a kind of merge time update mechanism. Another example are TTL or time to live merges. They look at the age of the input parts and possibly compress or move or delete tuples based on their age. And finally, there are aggregating merges. They are really interesting, but also a bit more complicated. The problem we try to solve here is that aggregation grouped by over billions and trillions of rows becomes super expensive. If you think about it, a normal aggregation in a normal select query needs to scan the entire table, build a hash table, and then for each row, find the aggregates and update the aggregates. Now, aggregating merges are supposed to help with that. What happens is that the aggregation is done at merge time. A select query will then simply use the pre-calculated aggregates instead of scanning everything. Um, you see an example on the right. There are two parts which are combined by an aggregating merge into a new part. Um, and then there are two aggregate columns, the maximum and the average latency. Both of them are of a special data type which allows to update them incrementally. For example, the average latency column is internally stored as a sum and a count. In the top left part, you find region APEC, which has an average latency stored as 80 and uh, stored as 80 for the sum and one for the count. In the top right part, you also find APEC with a sum of 180 and a count of three. In the merge part, APEC is computed as a sum of 260, which is 80 plus 180, and a count of four, which is one plus three. That's tricky. Um, but the point I'm trying to make on the slide is that merge time data transformation is a really powerful tool. The calculations are decoupled from the normal queries and they don't affect them. The only downside is that you cannot control when the transformation happens and on which parts they happen. If that is important for your use case, ClickHouse also provides means to run the transformations at query time, at least some of the transformations. Okay. A uh, few words about query execution in ClickHouse. Like every modern database, ClickHouse will try to utilize all server resources and also all cluster resources if you happen to have more than one server. To use all CPU cores, we unfold the physical execution plan into n lanes with n equals three in the example on the right. Each lane processes a disjoint range of the source data. So we basically split the source table into three equally large ranges in the example on the right. Of course, in practice, things don't always go that smooth. So you could have, for example, the situation that the lanes become imbalanced. For example, when the selectivities of the data ranges differ a lot from each other. If you let that happen, your course become underutilized. So what we do is we exchange, we insert exchange operators in certain places in the plan. The operators themselves pass multiple tuples at a time instead of single tuples, or to say it a bit more fancy, ClickHouse uses the vectorized volcano model. This has three, three performance benefits. First, 
It has pretty good cache locality. Second, it amortizes the cost of calling virtual functions. And third, it enables SIMT operations across multiple tuples. That's my last slide about SIMT, inst SIMT instructions. And we use them a lot to speed up hot loops and make it really quick. Hot loops in ClickHouse are often implemented in multiple versions that we call compute kernels. There's always a generic version and one or more vectorized versions, um, either using compiler auto vectorization or handwritten intrinsics. At runtime, the database will check the system capabilities and execute the fastest available compute kernel. The benefit of this approach is that the system utilizes um, modern hardware there, but it will also remain compatible with legacy systems, which our users happen to have a lot. That's it from my side today. If you'd like to know more, you could have a look at the overview paper that we just published this year at BLDB. So that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Sorry, my, my problem, not your problem, Robin. All right, sorry. Any questions for Robert? He basically described everything we talked about today, right? Actually, Robert, can you go back like to the slides of the execution engine? Which one? Right. This one? Perfect. Yes. Look. So look, exchange operators. You were asking why would you ever repartition re or distribute? It's exactly what Robert said, right? If the data shows up unbalanced, you have to you have to you know move things around uh, and repartition, and then distribute puts it puts it back together, right? The vectorized volcano model. So the SIMD piece we didn't really talk about, but. Uh, Volcano model we said was the iterator model, but again, the terms are used, they're not, they're used loosely. It's, they're using the vectorized batch model we talked about before. So they're sending up batches of tuples in between the operators to process now, uh, you know, it, at the same time. So now on the next slide, can you go to the SIMD one? So I, I, got, I got all excited while you were talking, you can't see me. Um, so we didn't talk about <laughs> SIMD, I'll, I'll send the lectures from last class, but basically, it's sort of what I was saying before, now you have a batch of tuples going up from one operator to the next, now, within, instead of processing them one, you know, one tuple at a time in that for loop, you can say, all right, let me take eight tuples, because again, I have a column. Let me take eight, eight values uh, across, across eight different attributes, eight, same column, eight values across eight different tuples. And then instead of me, again, looping through one by one, there are specialized instructions on CPUs that do like you know, one plus one or a number plus a number or something equals something. You can do that in parallel. So single instruction, multiple, multiple data. We don't talk about SIMD in this class, but that's, that's why they're getting amazing speed. So not only are they running the, the, the queries in parallel, doing all the things that we talked about today, then now in a single worker, they're basically running uh, operations on that worker in parallel at like the hardware level. So that's why, like, again, they get, they get amazing numbers. Sorry, I got excited. I, I, if anybody has any questions, sorry. Uh, <laughs> any questions for Robert? All right, uh, so let me show you guys uh, you can't see this here, Robert. Uh, well, I'm going to show them the, the ClickBench website. So as yeah. I was saying be say before, the um, ClickHouse has this amazing website where they keep track of the, the, the benchmarking for all these different database systems for this workload. There's, so it's uh, a bunch of select queries with no joins. But you can look at the ranking here. So this is from the Germans. Uh, and then below that is ClickHouse tuned. Right? And then after that is all, is all Doris. Right? So the Germans are yeah. all... What's that? I believe, I believe Umbra is number one right now. Umbra's number uh, one. Yes. Yeah. But you're, how far off you guys? Uh, you're, yeah. A little, a little bit. I mean, like, <laughs> actually, so do you, so you, I mean, do you know what's, what's holding you back from beating Umbra in, in your implementation? It's a really good question. Um, their code is uh, unfortunately um, closed source, so we couldn't have a, like a closer look. Correct. Um, they use query compilation a lot. Um, yes. Everything's based around query compilation in Umbra. Um, yeah. Now we use query compilation to some degree, um, but yeah, it's it, it's really hard to answer at this point. Question: Yes. Yeah. Are you guys using precompiled primitives at all, like for your operators? The question is: Are you using precompiled primitives? Yes. Yes. Right. If, so if you go back to the, is he still sharing? Yeah. So this slide here, right? So these these multi-target function, like that that gets pre-compiled, and then at runtime they're figuring out what the yeah. hardware is, and then based on that they like they know what they know what primitive you got to run. Like does something does thirty-two bit integer equal thirty-two bit integer, and then they will have the the SIMD versions of that, and then they can always yeah. fall back to the to the sort of scalar version of that. 
ClickHouse is a freak system. I mean, Robert, if, if you don't mind me saying this, like, like you have 20 versions of hash tables, right? You guys, you guys have all these amazing things where like most systems, like they'll have one hash table, but they'll have all these specialized based on the different data types and the size of them. And that's just to yeah. do hash tables, right? And they have yeah. all these different storage engines. So like the ClickHouse gets amazing performance because it just has so many different specialized components for different data types and, diff and different sort of, not workloads because it's st oh, still doing analytics, but like for different workload patterns. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, and again, the Germans are number one because they're like freaks. Uh, or, the, or this one, the, Thomas Norman, he's the freak. Uh, but ClickHouse, it, again, it, it's, how do you say this? ClickHouse gets great performance because it does, it has all these specializations for the different data types that we talked about. Umbra, it's just because he like, he, what they do is a query shows up and then instead of actually running, interpreting it like you guys do in BusTub, uh, and they're also not doing pre-compiled primitives the way ClickHouse does. He generates x86 assembly on the fly, runs that, he runs that through the assembler, and runs that, uh, you know, just the query starts running, but then in the background, he runs LLVM, then compile that assembly into like O2, and, and then, then slides that in when it's ready. So th there's a bunch of other tricks that the Germans are doing uh, at, at TU Minute for Umbra, but ClickHouse is like, ClickHouse is sort of throwing everything at it rather than being sort of specialized on, on one sort of one technique. Yeah. Right. So, so you can learn a lot from looking at the ClickHouse source code because, like, how do they do hash tables? There's different 20, 20 different versions of how they do it. Right. All right. Any last question? And Robert, are you in Amsterdam? Or are you in, you're in Germany? Where are you? I'm in Germany. Yeah. Got it. Okay. The good part? <laughs> the, no, the other one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. hey, that, that was a trick question. Yes. All right, guys. Let's give Robert a round of applause. Thanks. I guess ClickHouse is amazing. It's uh, like, how does it say this? is nice for the small things running your laptop. If you want to go hard, you, you do something like ClickHouse. Okay? Right. All right, Robert, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Perfect, Justin. Thank right. you. See you guys. Bye bye. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are thicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Feel a breeze at a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil. Records still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise to cool it off with St. Ives.